now. So welcome everyone to our open forum. This is uh, part of Feedback's uh, Bucks Food Revolution. So Feedback is an environmental campaigning organisation uh, that has uh, been in Bucks for the last two years. Um, and Feedback really sort of campaigns, researches and raises awareness about elements of the food system that could be changed um, in order to, to make the planet a better place, obviously against the climate crisis and better treatment of animals and various different uh, elements to the food system. So we've been funded by the Rothschild Foundation uh, to run a food citizenship project in Bucks uh, and that's really a raising, a ways, <laughs> raising awareness of uh, reducing food waste and sustainable diets. So we put together uh, with many of our partners uh, and contributors Bucks Food Revolution, which has been a collection of events over the last two days. Um, and it's been a great platform for people to share everything from their hobbies, their interests, their professions, their expertise um, and issues and topics that they're really, really enthusiastic in. So it's been a great sort of group of people coming together to share um, some of their knowledge and raise awareness about some of the causes that they're passionate about. And so that leads us uh, tonight, which is the final event of that weekend. Um, and I'm very pleased to obviously have Sheila in the uh, driving seat of, <laughs> of the, the beginning bit of this forum. And then we'll have sort of a bit of an open space uh, for you to share your ideas um, and thoughts about moving forward, um, as well as some of your top tips um, for sort of growing um, in the community, as well as your own private gardens and allotments. So I shall hand over to Sheila to introduce herself to anyone who doesn't know her um, and to start the proceedings. Okay, thanks, Becca. Right. Um, I just want to introduce you to the idea that this might be the first of a growers network meetings for the county. So you can uh, pat yourselves on the back as being possibly the first to have done this sort of network we, uh, meeting for growers. Um, just a little background on myself. I set up uh, Grow Together with Richard Andrews, who's here um, this year, and we run a community allotment for people with recovering from mental health issues. And we have that allotment in High Wycombe. We also run Grow to Give, and you may have picked up that talk that was uh, on earlier today where we encourage allotment growers to donate their spare produce. And it's taken to the food bank, One Can Trust, in Wickham and in uh, Wendover, they take their spare produce to the vineyard, which is their local um, food bank. Um, as part of Grow to Give, we've got some funding from public health to do master classes. One will be on composting, two on growing well, and four on cooking seasonal vegetables. So we're, as you're all allotment holders, you're very welcome to um, dip into that as well. Um, another project that Grow Together on is Urban Harvest, and that is about reducing food waste and encouraging and supporting people to uh, look out for fruits and vegetables and nuts that are growing in the hedgerow that's free for you to pick but also to encourage people with orchards and large gardens or we've had one lady that just had one tree but the amount of fruit that was off it that she wanted to donate is absolutely staggering so we're looking at perhaps developing that project to be a sort of pick your own between July and November for growers to share their produce with with other people so just to get started, in, in, I didn't want to be sat here with nobody saying anything. So I mustered some of my lovely friends at Forty Green Allotment to prepare some presentations. So Sean kindly has done us one on no dig. So if we could start with Sean's video to show us. Hello, my name is Sean and I'd like to do this video this today showing you the journey that I've had with this allotment plot. Back in 2017, 
this plot looked like this. It was full of brambles, nettles, bindweed, most annual weeds as well. Did I mention brambles? I absolutely hate brambles, but yes, a lot of brambles. So it was too big a plot and too difficult to dig the area. So I adopted a no dig approach. Charles Dowding, back in 1981, is the great profound source of no dig. In fact, he's got an excellent website. His name Charles Dowding, D-O-W-D-I-N-G. So back in 1981, he started no digging and an organic approach. Basically, it means covering the soil. You don't disturb the soil and the soil life. In fact, new evidence has come to light in that the microorganisms and the fungi network underneath the soil are just incredible and you don't want to break them because it helps the plant roots absorb water and hence nutrients. So that what I started with on this plot three years ago was I covered the area with cardboard. I raided the local white goods store for cardboard every Thursday evening and Bosch, I might tell you, make a very good quality cardboard. And I cover, the car I cover the plot with cardboard and then with as much horse manure as I could. We have a friend who's got uh, some horses and I must have got about a hundred litres worth of manure. Put it on the top and then covered it with weed suppressant fabric. So that was done in about February and I was able to start planting in the April and May. So I started with one bed and then I progressively have gone more and more into the plot. You couldn't even see the end of the plot. It was full of trees and shrubs. And did I mention brambles? Yes, loads of brambles and ivy, oh, ivy. So I'm just about to open my fourth bed now and preparing work at the very end on the fifth bed, which is all going to be bee pollinating and pollinating attractive plants like um, Linmanthes douglasi, which is the poached egg plant, as well as all the lavenders and Syringa vulgaris um, and but it, so this is going to be a very good for pollinators and I've also made a little pond again good for pollinators come round and show you the pond it was originally a bath but it's now, it's, and I've made a nice shelf so wildlife can easily get in and out. The one big thing about no dig is covering the ground with mulch. Mulch can be wood chips, horse manure, garden compost, um, grass clippings, dried is better. And you never have enough compost. So I've started my composting empire. You need at least a cubic metre of um, area for each bin, otherwise it won't heat up enough. The plastic Daleks are very nice and neat looking, but they don't generate enough heat to make enough compost to put on your plot. This is compost, which must be ooh, maybe six months old. Still got some woody bits in it, but it's also nice and nutritious. The next bin, although empty, I've just recently put this on the plot and then covered it with weed suppressant fabric so absolutely no weeds can grow. And it's all if I come far, I can show you. This is the bed that I've just put. Underneath here, there's there. As you can see, there's a nice layer of compost about an inch thick and I do that once I've taken all the plants that I want out and before I plant the next one in. The big thing is you feed the soil not the plants and that's it. Hopefully a productive year this year. Thank you. Thank you. Well thank you so much. Wow.
That was awful watching myself. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> I could never be an actress. <laughs> Sheila, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I muted myself. I was just saying to Becca, shall we do as we did before and have the videos and then the questions? Becca's disappeared. Okay. That was, aw that was awesome, Be Sean. That was very, very yeah. good. <laughs> Becca, are you there? She was losing I her. You're very kind. You're very kind, all of you. I am here. Just give me two minutes. I need to eat. To load the new video. Okay, while she's loading up, any questions on No Dig? Mm -hmm. Do you tread on the area that you've made No Dig now, or do you have yes, board to yeah. make paths? Um, I do. I mean, yes, I do. Um, the, I mean, the big thing is not to disturb the mycelial fungi, which um, apparently they go miles. I mean, it's absolutely incredible, these fungi. Um, uh, so you don't want to compact it too much, but yes, I do walk on the beds. Mm. I think the compost aerates it and makes it spongy enough um, that you can. I mean, Charles Dowding walks on his, so yeah, he I does. Think, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I walk on mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any more questions on that one? Can I ask something, Sheila? Yeah. Yeah, it's Go just uh, when um, Sean plants her plants in the spring. Does she put on an extra layer of uh, compost or anything finer on the top, or does she just put them in? No, um, you just do it once a year. Uh, once you've got it going, a may, maybe an inch, two inch depth, if you can. I mean, you never have enough compost or mulch. Yeah. I mean, you just never do, unfortunately. That's a fact yeah. of life. But um, yeah, you just feed the soil once a year, once you've cleared it. Yeah. So you're not adding any other um, manures or uh, no. fertilizers? No, not at all. Okay. That's it. So when you pull the plants out from the season, yeah, I have heard people saying they just chop them off and leave the roots in the soil to rot. Have you adopted yes. that? Yes. Um, I did that last year with my runner beans and found they grew again this year. Um, yeah. <laughs> but obviously, you know, they might be in the wrong place. So that's the only problem about leaving uh, the weeds, the roots behind. So hang on, I've got a message here. What's Bill Are there any crops? What's it? Yes, I think all bean roots. Yeah, how deep should the compost layer be? Oh yeah, one to two inches um, is good. Obviously, more the better. And are there any crops that don't like the compost mulch? Like potatoes, question mark. Ah, oh, potatoes I grow in containers, large containers, basically because um, I grow new potatoes um, a lot and their skins are so delicate that if they touch um, a stone, you know, it, it distorts the skin. So I grow those in containers where the compost is fine. It's, you know, it's bagged compost, multi-purpose compost from a store. Lovely. So I... Kyla then says that she needs um, the broad bean roots in the soil. Yeah, beans um, are very good. They are nitrogen fixers, um, so they will enhance the soil. Yes, beans are good to leave in. Um, just, can I just ask, uh, Sean, about the, uh, the manure that you got the first year? You were yes. saying, put that on. What sort of depths did you have for that? Presuming that was thicker than an inch or two. That was thicker, yes. That was um, oh, maybe four inches, right. four yeah. to six inches to get it going. Because, I mean, the plot was in a terrible condition. Um, and, I mean, Charles Dowding, when you watch his videos, he never seems to have the problem with bindweed that a lot of tears have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even after exposing, um, when I put, pulled back the weed suppressant fabric, you can see the bindweed roots and they're all sort of yellow and curly and so much easier than to take out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions about no dig? Uh, can I just ask about the general weed population, Sean? How do you deal with it? 
badly. I think badly. Um, the weeds are definitely getting more under control, apart from chickweed. But I think that is in the horse manure, unfortunately. Um, so chickweed, I I do suffer with, but the bindweed is is under control actually this year. So say so maybe two, three, three years say, and the bindweed you get a little bit, but it's not it's not overwhelming. But it's hoeing. I generally hoe the weeds because I catch them before they set seed. Once they set seed or flower, then they really should be dug up, you know, with a little yeah. fork. No, nothing serious. Ah, uh, Bill says, are you worried about using... Oh, it's gone. Yeah, are you worried about using fresh manure, such as the manure, manure on the allotment at present? Um, no, because I do cover it with this black fabric. And as a result, that warms up the soil... Um, and hence the decompo decomposition is quicker. So um, as you see, I've just done the manure um, and I cover it with the plastic and, and that's great. I mean, particularly courgettes love it. They'd, they'd love to sit on a compost heap. They just, they, you know, they crave nutrients um, and they didn't seem to be affected at all. In fact, they thrived on um, <laughs> the raw manure that was there on the plot. Okay. I think Phil, Phil had a question. Right. Had his hand up, I don't know. Yeah. Phil, do you want to do your question? You have to unmute yourself, Phil. Unmute in the bottom left. Yeah, yeah. Um, top right. The question is follow on okay. from the milk. With um, horse manure, um, are you happy... Sean, with mulching, I lying it down, even though it's fresh, over the winter. Being yes, in the yes, I have been taking it from the pile, laying it down fresh, and then covering it with this this weed suppressant fabric, which will warm it up that little bit quicker, and help it will decompose faster. And by you know April, it'll be fine. Okay. 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 Lovely. Well done. Pleasure. Pleasure. Masterclass. Thank you. <laughs> um, are we ready with biodiversity? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to show you a few things on my allotment plot that I do to help wildlife whilst growing vegetables and flowers as well. So this is my plot. Does look rather wild and some may say messy probably not what you'd expect on a standard allotment plot and first off I'm going to show you the pond because the quickest way to get some wildlife into your garden or allotment any little area you've got is a pond so if you can have a pond put a pond in because they are magical and um, there are some frogs you won't see them today and I don't know whether they constantly stay in the pond or go in my rills but they're about anyway. I've seen them here and there. So it's all rather wild here. Uh, we've got natural edges, so there's lots of hiding spots for the frogs and they won't get affected in the summer by drying up on some slabs or anything like that because um, sometimes the babies can. Uh, we've got some nettles, really good to have some nettles. I know they spread a lot so I do have to keep them in check but they are absolutely amazing for butterflies. They're also super healthy. They give you lots of protein. They give you lots of antioxidants. You can eat the leaves and the seeds. So nettles, really good for wildlife and yourselves. We've got a log pile over here. So that's for hibernating frogs. Um, anything else that wishes to hibernate in there. There's a lot of things that do enjoy log piles as a habitat. So we've got that over there. And then these massive leaves here, they are giant butterbur. Um, so they're huge leaves in summer, spring and summer. Um, they die back in winter, but they're great for creating some more hiding spots, keeping the area a bit cooler, a bit shadier for the wildlife. And then there is a tree here. So there's a bit of a debate on sighting ponds under trees and whether that's good or bad. But I've got mine so that it does still get some shade from the tree. Um, just to keep it a bit cooler and help keep the water in as well because you want natural rainwater you don't really want water from the tap so in summer when it gets baking hot and starts to evaporate the tree is quite handy for keeping that water in there 
I've got a real mix of vegetables and flowers and all sorts about my plot. Um, I plant using companion planting so that the wildlife is encouraged to then keep each other in check to help me grow things. I don't use any pesticides or anything, it's all organic. Um, so there's some really good companion planting charts that you can find online, so just give it a Google and you'll find loads of stuff. Um, so that's what I do, it's all mixed in and it looks really pretty when you've got all the flowers and things as well rather than having lines of vegetables. It's a bit more interesting, a bit more difficult to stay on top of but it's good for wildlife and it can look really nice. These are some artichoke heads. Um, so one thing that is key in autumn winter, as long as you can do it really, is to keep all these plant heads standing because they may, for some people, look ugly, but they are amazing for our birds. So there's some more over here, um, and then there's a few over here. We've even got some flowers still over here. And the birds love getting the seeds from them, but also insects do hibernate in the stems of the plants. So by keeping these stems, you've actually got loads of habitats here and that's where they're all going to overwinter. So a lot of us will cut all of this down over winter, cover it all up and then wait to begin again in spring. But autumn and winter are crucial. And things like teasel, they're really good for goldfinches. So they will get their beaks into these tiny little holes and get the seeds out in winter. So really good food for goldfinches. And they look really cool as well. So the rills are just another spot to hang on to some rainwater. We don't get as much now, so it's really good to hang on to what we do get. I've got a bathtub to hang on to some as well. Um, it's better for the soil if you're using rainwater as well. You're not affecting the um, balance of minerals and nutrients in there. And as much as we talk about the wildlife above the ground, the wildlife in the soil is, if it's probably more important to be honest. So really looking after your soil is the main thing for wildlife because that is then gonna support everything well, keep your plants healthy, and then they're more nutritious for our wildlife as well. So always think about the soil. Um, and then also things like weeds in your path, just keep some of them. It's fine. We don't need to just be clearing weeds all the time. If they're not getting in the way, they're not affecting some of your plants that you really need, or uh, they're like your key plants, then obviously weed around them, that's absolutely fine. But just don't keep weeding. Just keep some for the wildlife as well, because they are really beneficial, and sometimes more beneficial than the plants that we grow. Um, another thing that I'm trying is this is my new path and I've got loads of thyme. So these were only planted this year and hopefully they're gonna spread out. So it's gonna be these nice patches that spread together. So it'll just be like one big area of green. You can walk on all of these. So we are allowed to walk on the plants and thyme is really, really good for bees. So the bees will kind of rub themselves in the thyme and the natural oils from it are an antifungal and antimicrobial kind of solution. So they will protect the bees. So if the bees need to heal themselves, they will use thyme to do that. Um, and this is just a path. So instead of doing a path that's just full of a hard surface, just mix some plants in, in particular thyme, and you've got the best of both worlds. You've helped some bees and you've still got your path and it smells amazing when you walk on it as well. One other thing, going back to the soil, and I'm sorry if anyone feels dizzy because I'm kind of just wandering about and not really paying attention to how this looks, but um, another thing is don't put plastic on your soil in winter. Soil is alive with so many things and you're just not giving them the stuff that the um, species in the soil need. So here I'm just storing some horse manure for now. I'm going to spread this around. 
So that's one way of not using plastic, just cover it in something else like horse manure to keep the weeds down. Um, but at least the soil can still breathe um, and there are going to be some nutrients going in there. Ideally, just leave as many plants in as you can because those plants are still going to be um, exchanging nutrients and oxygen and things with the soil. Um, so that's the ideal scenario, but if you're growing things, then you're probably going to end up leaving some beds empty. So just don't put plastic on them, just try and keep it more natural. And basically, just kind of do what nature would do, and you're going to be on a good path to helping it. I guess it's just getting around some of the things that we have in horticulture at the moment, like the tidiness and things like that. It's just kind of thinking of it differently. And if anything, I think it's an excuse to kind of sit back and watch it all and see all the different changes and observe all the wildlife coming in rather than spending that half an hour or so on your knees weeding. Just sit and watch. Maybe we could do one in summer and then you can see it in summer as well. Um, but yeah, this is it. This is the plot and this is one way that you could help some wildlife. I suppose a couple of books as well which are really good. It's Kate Bradbury. Uh, she's really good for wildlife gardening. Um, Alice Fowler, she uh, has a column. She's good for some tips. She's got a really cool garden, lots of perennial vegetables. Um, and also Wilding um, is an amazing book. Really, really interesting by Isabella Tree. So if you haven't read that, read it because it is wonderful. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully you can try a few new techniques for the new year. All right, enjoy everyone, bye. That was wonderful, wasn't it? Those of us that are at the 40 Green allotment will recognize Sarah's plot. And remember that wonderful supper she did for us from the veg on her plot? She's not here, but does anybody get any comments or questions? Sorry, I was multitasking, I am her. <laughs> Oh, you are. Oh, <laughs> I just looked along the faces and I didn't see you. Okay, Phil, go ahead. Sarah, um, as usual, you're, you're, you're um, quite amazing and, and, and you know that. Um, as for not putting <laughs> weeds, I'm afraid that's what I do. The question is, not putting plastic on your soils, is the membrane that we use, which is sort of water permeable, okay? Uh, that we're putting on over the winter to uh, it, and in the in the spring there'll be no weed so is that okay is that called plastic or membrane is that okay um yeah I suppose I was thinking more about where you haven't really got any way of getting the oxygen and the water in so the ones that kind of just completely seal it um so you're just kind of not allowing the soil to have any exchange at all um, but also what I did think of afterwards, I should have mentioned, not plastic, but another alternative is using green manure. So just throwing on some crimson clover or something like that and using that just to keep, because nature puts the weeds there because the soil should be covered basically. So if we are just using plants like cover crops and things like that instead, then that is a much more beneficial way of doing it. But then I suppose with the heat warming, the manure and that kind of thing, as long as it's permeable, then at least you've got the exchange there. So then that's better than nothing. Okay. Any more questions? Any things that you're doing on your own plots to enhance biodiversity? Anybody else? Well, like Sarah, I too grow flowers. I think growing flowers amongst your vegetables is very important. Particularly English marigolds, those are great. Yeah. I've got a, yeah. Forage for the bees. Perfect. And flowers as mm. well, I believe. Mm. To protect the bees. Got a vested interest. Yeah, ivy, you know, certain selected areas with like Sarah's got with her nettles, I've got with my ivy, with the um, which is old ivy, so they've got flowers, yeah, uh, which is good for the early bees. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we've been putting a lot of flowers on the community allotment because we grow them 
for the gardeners to take home. But I think this year, Richard and I were probably looking more at the companion planting as well. So we focus on having seasonal plants throughout the season that are going to be able to help the pollinators rather than just the ones that come in and look pretty between June and August. But we look at what we can have there all the seasons to, to look after the wildlife. Anybody else want to ask any questions? Um, I'd quite like to just mention something. I tried this season to integrate flowers into my beds, but uh, my um, allotment gets very, very dry. I found that the flowers did brilliantly, but the vegetables seemed to suffer. So obviously I'm doing, <laughs> doing something wrong. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've got seeds now for next time um, of the poached egg plant, and I'm picking up on other uh, flowers which should companion plants with, with certain things. So I'm hoping that will make a difference. But I think there is a factor in whatever you put in a bed is going to absorb some of the moisture. And if you have a very dry plot, um, it is a bit of an issue. So mm. I don't know what to do about it except feed the soil, which is what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Any comments, anybody? Are we done? Shall we move on to the next one? Um, Les, you didn't produce any uh, artwork to go with your, your item. Would you like to talk to us about <laughs> no water? This is for Les. Brilliant. If remember you unmute to, yourself, yeah, here yeah, he is. Yeah, remember to do that. Well done. Good. It's it's not zero watering, it's limited watering. Okay. And the trick is actually the preparation of the soil in the first place. Feed the soil, not the plants. You need loads of compost and well-rotted manure. The manure from Steve Jones is very fresh. And it needs stacking for several months unless you want to use it as a mulch which is as Sean and said, you can do, put it on quite thickly and put one of these geotex membranes on, not a polythene, but allows the water to go through. But it, the downside for me is it contains shavings rather than straw, which locks up the nitrogen nutrients, as does wood chips. So I only use wood chips very sparingly. In fact, when I see people spreading wood chips all over their plot, I'm thinking, I wouldn't do that. It seems to me you're locking up some of the soil fertility. The other plan I've followed over a number of years is, is to use edged beds, following good advice from Bob Plowerdew. If you create beds about four feet wide, I don't know what that is in metric, um, it limits your temptation to walk all over the plot, which compacts the soil. So the only time I actually walk on the beds is when I'm digging it sorry Sean but I, I've got a serious problem with bindweed which goes down an awful long way so I find if I dig it in the spring it gets the bindweed down to at least 10 or 15 inches and then it's not a problem until the following year. Uh, my allotment slopes from Penn to Beaconsfield if I can describe it that way so you look to have the plants that really love moisture up the lower end of the plot, the Beaconsfield end of the plot. So I've grown my runner bean plants on the end of the plot, that side, for the last 30 years. I've had an allotment at 40 green for 35 years now. Um, over the years, I've worked out if you plant plants rather than seeds direct, they normally have a much better chance of growing out. So I usually start my plants that you would normally sow as seeds in pots, starting them off in the greenhouse, such as peas, corn and beans. Once planted out, water them well just the once, flood them, and then leave nature to take over. If you water them several days later, you're not encouraging the plant to send its roots out looking for moisture, developing a strong root system. So you're creating a rod for your own back if you regularly water them 
because they think, well, this is easy now. I don't have to do anything to find any water. Somebody's going to pour it into over my head. Particularly runner beans, double dig the trench, incorporate loads of organic matter in the bottom of the bottom spit. You can use shredded paper, but again, like wood chips, it locks up the nitrogen, reducing the soil fertility. I never water potatoes once in, or sweet corn, or soft fruit, or courgettes, or butternut squash. Just plant each of them at plants grown in the greenhouse on top of the equivalent of a bucket full of well ready compost, and they grow away fine. So that's my principle of not overwatering things. Just give them a drench when you put the plants in, unless you have a really, really dry summer, in which case I might be tempted to water the courgettes, but I never bother with potatoes. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you very much. There we are. We've got different opinions creeping in here, haven't we? All producing crops um, in your different ways. Any comments? You can, I also, um, with Les, grow plants, not, I don't direct sow anything, um, but there, you can also buy, it's, it's under a brand name called Root Grow, which is mycorrhizal fungi, and if you sprinkle it on the roots of your plant, or even in the planting hole, that will help um, the plants seek out water as well, so you don't need to water it manually yourself as it's growing because it, it will find its own water. Yeah. That's the comment I've got. Right, so you use that on small plants, because I've always associated that with planting shrubs and trees, but you, you can use them on delicate yeah. small plants yeah. as well. Yeah. That was interesting. That's something I've never heard of before. Any it's other just comments? A, oh, just to go sorry. on to say that I, I, started growing, I started growing my peas in pots because there's nothing more disappointing than planting peas in a row with all the attendant protection to keep the pigeons away. And then you have a really spotty germination, all the mice get them. Whereas if you plant plants, people are really impressed with a full row <laughs> <laughs> of peas thinking, what, how does he do that? <laughs> We've no, been saying that for years. <laughs> I agree. There's nothing more disappointing to just put your seeds in and they come up every third one well, it, oh, yes. it's, it's also such a waste of the land you know land scarce so you want to squeeze every last bit of juice out of the particular lemon so intensive cropping is what it's about yeah what i'm tempted to do then is someone will feel sorry for me and give me their peas and have no idea which peas i've got which named plant because they're all mixed up in a row then so yes i agree that's a good idea can I just say that I used uh, Les's method for the first time and uh, this year and it was very successful because he was lecturing me about water over watering <laughs> and, I, and I did what he said and it works. Wow. <laughs> Remember we did have a very wet season though. Well, well part of it, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we've got one more from Barry now. So shall we put your slides up, Barry? Please, <clears> yes. <throat> okay, um, we're probably all used to these things appearing on the uh, uh, our runners. These are the nasty guys, aren't they? They're the uh, black fly and Years ago, uh, when I first started with the allotment, I was instructed to go and uh, spray it with water or to rub it with my gloves to get rid of the black fly because they are uh, bad, bad for us. If we go to the next slide, please. I don't know how that works. Becca will do it. Thank you. Um, we also yeah. have good guys. And I, I was being rather foolish. All these <laughs> good guys on the allotment, like this lovely little larvae, uh, I was knocking off thinking they were um, nasty, they were pests and they were like my black flies. But these things eat the black fly. This is one of the good ones, a uh, hoverfly. The next one, please, and we can see what 
a ladybird larvae looks like. And the next slide, we can see what a lace, lace wing larvae looks like. Now, the lace wing larvae, they are very good. They eat about 200 black flies a week. I think it's a week or a day, but they're, they're very hungry. So uh, they're the ones we want to entice onto the allotments and encourage. So that is why I said we should have a lace wing hotel which we go to the next slide, please. I think I've got, this is, this is what they look like when they get older. They're very delicate. They're very good for pollinating as well. But if you go to the Friends of the Earth website, you can get a better copy of the Lacewing Hotel, how to make it, which is out of uh, cardboard and old lemonade bottles and putting it inside and putting it upside down. If we go to the next slide, please. Bit like uh, uh, doing the uh, <laughs> briefing, isn't it? Um, and so basically, as Friends of the Earth have got how uh, you can make these hotels to encourage the wildlife into your garden. So that's what I thought about doing. But before I did this, we go to the next slide. Um, well, you can't even see it, so I do apologize. Um, <laughs> There's all types of plants here, which I could set, send it out to people, which shows dill and uh, ladybirds and lacewing like that. Then coriander is ladybirds, lacewings and hoverfly like that. So what I did this year, I planted a lot of coriander and fennel at the end of my run of beans. And I had no issue with black fly. Wow. So, uh, it was a case of, uh, I adopted my principles, I, I left the plants well alone, following Leslie's rules about watering, and uh, I'd had these two, uh, at the end of my pl plots, coriander and uh, fennel, and granted it looked a lot nicer than what it did before, and uh, it got rid of my black flies. Um, this year we're going to, no next year we're going to plant the bottom one which you can't see, which is a lemon gem called Taggartese, and that's to really get the uh, uh, lace wings and hoverflies to come to the plot. Uh, and we found that that was working very successfully. And I'm going to try the lemon gem, lemon Taggartese with my carrots when I plant them uh, also. So uh, you might have a, a funny color on, on plot 17. Um, also, uh, Monty showed something on one of his gardens programs was about planting uh, parsnips and leave, sacrificing one parsnip for the next year. And apparently uh, black flies love parsnips that are on, on its second year. Uh, could grow to really tall plants and they love it. So I'm going to try that also again this year to get rid of the black flies because I'm trying to be a lazy gardener. <laughs> We're all up for that. That's wonderful. Have you got, have you finished or is there some more? I'll, 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 there's nothing else. Thank you. That is really, I like the little table at the end as well. Because there's nothing more horrible than having to go along and squish the black fly on the back of your beans, is there? Well, I know that I've got neighbouring plots where they go around with uh, water and uh, squirt it. In fact, I bought a a, uh, a high-powered uh, sorry, you can spray and that yeah. work. I'm prompting for your size, but you can only do that when the plants are pretty small. We, Sorry, come Jack. I'll Sorry. come in, I'll come into shot. I was gonna say we you can only really squirt them with water and squish them by hand when the plants are pretty small. By the time we've had about 20 rather than 20 French beans, yes. So 40 plants, you can't squish all of those by hand and water squirt them with, um, with water by hand. And if you're too vigorous, you damage the leaves. So yeah, I think I think the idea with the spray is you add a soap solution. So it's the soap that disrupts the black fly rather than just the water it's the soapy well, solution I they don't like 
the thing the theory is that the spokes or the buns up there have one put it politely orifices yeah spiracles that's it whereas the water yeah. really just to dislodge them but yeah. Yeah. why do that if you can get nature to do that absolutely the only trouble is i have i had a fennel plant on my allotment and it grows to australia and mary was not very pleased with that so she made me dig it out there's two fennels isn't there there's the fennel bowl yeah and there's the fennel well the one that sort of the, bite, I think the, the bite feathery bite. one yeah. Yeah. the bronze fennel is that Am I, I was using the feathery ones yes i have to say we grow the ones we grew this year we pulled up because we were rotating the, the, yes. um, yeah. the crops and we didn't have any problem with them having yeah. immense uh, roots. roots too far yeah no. Okay, lovely. Um, have we got some questions here? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't move the. I've got, it, it also, goes. garlic, Kyla, would you like to say garlic solution added to the water spray as per James Wong? Um, and you mentioned parsnips. You'll have to read that one, Becca, because I've got something blocking. No worries. Uh, we always try to wait until our parsnips have been well frosted before we start the harvest. Oh, no, but this is the next year. Okay. To allow them to flower. Okay, but the answer to Bill's question is, wait until they're well frosted, because that converts some of the starch in the parsnips into sugar, which makes them sweeter. So it's a chemical reaction induced by a lower temperature. Mm. But all they're saying, Bill, is leave one plant, don't eat that one, leave it in until the next summer and let it flower. So you're just having one sacrificial parsnip that you leave through to the summer. Um, what else? These are such inspiring. Thank you, Hannah. Really useful tips. Coriander and fennel, get rid of black flies. Anybody else got some favourite tips? Companion um, she, planting? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I uh, watched a video on organic gardening uh, by an experienced organic gardener uh, recently. And she, I asked her, how would she prevent the, um, what is it, um, larvae of, uh, is it a wasp or something, which climbs up an apple tree and then um, moth. They, they get into the codling yeah. moth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she said, um, not she didn't mention grease bands, but sh what she was saying is encourage the birds to come to that tree by putting fat balls and other uh, food in there. So mm. I'm going to try that uh, this coming year because although I tend to get a good crop, um, most of the apples have been visited. And I just yeah. wondered if anybody has a better solution. Did she not like the grease bands? She didn't mention it. Okay. Um, and it, yeah. Because so the, life cycle, the life cycle of the codling moth begins in the soil and the, the sort of caterpillar climbs up the tree. Yeah. And in the spring, it enters in the back of the flower. So then it's actually in the middle of the apple as the apple grows. So the codling yeah. moth is there until you bite in the apple, unless there's a hole. And that means the codling moth has now exited the yeah. apple to take yes. on its next stage. So yeah. that's what the bands are for. It's supposed to stick the caterpillar to it as it's walking up the tree. Yes. I'd, 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 do, I'd do both. I'd do both. Encourage the birds to come, as you yes, say. Yes, absolutely. And mm. put several grease bands on. So if the first one okay. misses, then the second one gets it. Yeah. Okay. If you and, don't want to spend money Sean, on were you, bands. Sean, were you saying something? Oh. Um. It was just the it's the actually it's the adult female they're they're wingless and they climb up the tree to lay the eggs but you've oh, got to put the yeah. you've got to put the grease band on at the right time of year um, and I'm I can't remember I can't remember it's earlier than you think is is from memory I'm sorry I'm I'm studying my level three at the moment and. I'm on plant tissue so I haven't quite got onto my pests and diseases but uh, I think. I think the band has to be up at a um, at an early time. Early, early time. I think it's early, but I will double check that. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd leave it know. on. I'd leave it on twenty four seven. Yeah, good one. Yeah, make sure it's still sticky though. I suppose. Some yeah. people just recommend that you just put cardboard round the tree, uh, with corrugated cardboard, 
and then they go up there and they nest in the corrugated cardboard. Oh, really? <laughs> That's yeah. a cheap method for you. Yeah, we've got one. Thank you. And then and put a ring of grease above it in case they, in case yes, they don't get the message. Well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any more tips? I think we've got a question from Phil about um, broad beans and black pie. Better to plant in winter or spring? Yeah. No idea. Okay, I can okay. kick in with this one. I'll kick in with this one. To start All right, with. you did that one, Les. <laughs> if you plant um, broad beans in the winter, you're relying on them overwintering and ending up with a decent row of plants. Doesn't work all the time because sometimes you get them in the ground too early and they get too leggy and then they fall over and end up being eaten by slugs. So I always grow my uh, broad bean plants as plants in the spring and I deal with the black fly with, you won't like this, <laughs> chemical methods to deal with them, zap them and pinch out the tips. Okay, was there another person that wanted to comment on winter or spring? Um, I, I only grow autumn and uh, plant the pl broad beans out in the autumn because the plants are bigger and you get a much better crop than if you do it in the spring. Um, and yeah, so I've given up with small plants. So, yeah. Sean, you grow yours in a pot? No, no well, they, they grow in pots to start them, with. But yes. I plant them out. I've already got mine in the allotment already. Yeah. Um, so they're about eight inches tall now. Yeah. Um, yes, because, I mean, if I, plant, if I plant mine in the spring, the plants are smaller and the crop is not nearly as, um, as, as healthy. I mean, it's just not as abundant as if you grow them in the autumn. Yeah. And yes, pinching out the tip is essential. Yeah. Can I just say that um, I, I've tried both methods, both spring and autumn. And if you put them in in the autumn, it's supposed to, they're supposed to mature um, earlier than the black fly arrive, but it absolutely doesn't work. I mean, the only thing I would agree with is that you get a very good crop. But if the black fly get to them and, and they are persistent, then of course that ruins it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it sometimes depends on the year. Yeah, it depends it? on the yeah. year. But um, I mean, this year, for example, was particularly dry uh, after a wet spring uh, and they didn't like that. The, the black fly arrived and completely decimated despite pinching out all the tips and spraying with water uh, and you know, um, fingering them off and all this kind of thing, it just didn't work. But up, up, up on my plot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, just looking at some more questions, um, we've got just found out about the grease bands. It's late October. Wow. To put the grease yeah. bands on. Come on, on. quick. It yeah. is early. Yeah. yeah. And Bill, how dare you ask this question? Dare I ask how to get rid of horseradish? <laughs> this has been our battle for the last five or six years. Kev even rang Gardener's Question Time on Radio 4 and all they could say was, best not to grow it. Not very helpful when it's already established. Mm. Has anybody else tried to grow horseradish? Yes, I have. Yeah. It gets bigger every year. I, I just cruel regret to sell the plant. Should it's never sell it. <laughs> there is a chemical solution. Just spray it with potassium chlorate. You tried that, Bill. The, the problem is potassium chlorate is not readily available now because the IRA used to use it for other purposes. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Well, generally, okay. if you can dig down about six inches and then literally cover it with, um, stop all light getting at it, it, it's, it, it will definitely weaken it. Normally, six inches is sort of like the magic figure. If you can dig that far down, generally things won't grow, particularly if you block light. 
Yeah, I think Bill has tried everything. Yeah. Oh, two feet! Oh, we oh jumped down two feet and covered it. Yeah, he has tried everything. Oh, I think he's tried the chemicals as well, Les. Oh man! Yeah, we yeah. won't limited, give up. We yeah. only have a limited armamentarium now because the health and safety people have got in on the act. They're not allowed to buy the real proper stuff anymore. Uh, are nuclear weapons okay? He says. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you can oh, find dear. something to deal with my bind with, I'll be very grateful. Yeah, small nuclear weapons. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. We've um, It's seven o'clock. That hour has skipped by. Um, I know, Hannah, are you still here? Is Hannah here? Hi. Yeah. Um, did you want to take this opportunity just to float your ideas while you've got some allotment people in front of you? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's really great to hear so many successes. Um, I'm a real amateur at growing, so I, uh, but my husband um, has an apple juice business, so I was furiously writing down notes about coddling moth because it makes it really difficult if, um, if we've got fruit that's riddled with pests but um, I so yes yeah, so I work for Stain and we've been investigating the need for a food partnership for Buckinghamshire so that's everyone working together whether it's individuals you know people in the community whether it's the local authorities food and farming businesses institutions and everything um, to make our food in Buckinghamshire better and one thing that I did, um, a report that I'm about to produce, is I talked to as many parish councils as possible and found out which ones had allotments and of those, which ones had waiting lists. And it was amazing. They were all, you know, there were a lot of them that were saying we've had a massive explosion of interest because of COVID and so on. Anyway, I'm going on a bit, but I'm just really keen to support anything that you want to do, Sheila, and others. Um, to build this uh, allotment network and community gardening network across the county. And I know Becca would, from feedback, would probably be able to support on that as well. And, I, you know, I feel like just from this of sharing tips with each other, there's obviously a lot that people can get from talking together. But also it might be that there are allotment groups that want to open up new plots for those people that are really interested in in starting out and you know and, and we can kind of make links with the with landowners or with Bucks Council or whatever to try and um, make that make that happen as well so anything I can do to help make things happen I'm really keen to. Okay any thoughts from people I mean would you like to repeat this sort of growers forum a couple of times a year and we'll get different specialists or speakers and one of our own just to talk about what they've they've learned as we have today and um, doing a map of where all the community growing sites are yeah um, definitely yeah it's yeah? very well. yeah because irene yeah. started this all off you did our little yes. get together in 40 green which we all enjoyed so i yeah. asked if we could copy yeah. it and do it today yeah, yeah. Uh, that was very informal, but I think this has taken it a step further. I think mm. one uh, amazing difference that you've made is to make these little um, films that we've seen by Sarah and Sean mm. and so on, and, and, and Barry and Les. It yeah. really makes a difference. And now we know how it can be done, how it can be done better. Uh, we, we can look forward to what we might be able to as individuals contribute for next time and how to do it mm. so well done i think it's absolutely tremendous well done okay. right there you go hannah you've got a thumbs up <laughs> right I, if uh, if we're done i would just like to close our first i just growers oh, network I, oh I, hannah I, becca yeah yeah sorry if only because someone's asked about the recording um, so the recordings of all the weekend, we're going to just um, pull, them, pull them down and do some editing over the next couple of weeks. Um, so we should be able to um, then circulate it to people then that um, came to the meetings, as well as trying to get it up on YouTube uh, for people that haven't been able to, to join us this evening and throughout the weekend. 
uh, to access as well. Um, I will just stick a quick poll up if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, just answering that about actually just a bit of feedback. And um, so you can tick more than one um, if there's a couple of options that take your fancy. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much for feedback and I'll, I'll hand back to Sheila. I'm just filling in my form. Oh, good girl. <laughs> I'm not... Yeah. I don't, don't think that's our normal form, is it? In it's growing point, as we watch it, this one. No, I think because you're a co-host, you may not get the chance. Oh, I see. I'm seeing it differently. Yeah. Right. You're part okay. of the management now. Woo! Yeah. Okay. Is that Has everybody made their choice? That's wonderful. You enjoyed the meeting and meeting other keen growers found it useful. Perfect. I'm glad. And thank you so much, Team Naughty Green, for stepping up and uh, helping us to get this uh, event off the ground. Can I close this window now? Which window? I've still got the polling up. Oh, yeah, That's you can close it. Yeah. Window. Yeah. Um, so yes, thank you. And I shall continue talking to Hannah about where we could take this forward um, and just spread it across Buckinghamshire and beyond, hopefully. And we'll get some really impressive speakers in if you want particular top topics covered, or we can just use our own um, local people that have taken an interest in a particular subject as we have today. So thank you all so much for joining me on a Sunday night. Um, and thank you, Becca, you've worked so hard this weekend. It's been an absolute force. <laughs> that you, yeah, that you've managed to pull it all together. But still, we've all done it once now, so we know how to do it okay. again. Definitely.